Cholesterol education seems to still be a hurdle sometimes for many patients, despite the amount of knowledge we have out there and even breaking it down to patients as just good and bad, which a lot of things in medicine are never that simple for patients. A lot of patients still struggle with cholesterol management. Why do you think that is? And how do you approach educating newer patients about cholesterol management? I think that's a great question. And the important thing for patients is to realize that cholesterol, particularly LDL cholesterol or bad cholesterol, is a surrogate marker for cardiovascular events. But even if we step back a moment, Patrick, one third of patients present with a heart attack with a normal cholesterol. And the first event or the first symptom of a heart attack in 50% of patients is a heart attack. So cholesterol becomes our surrogate marker for cardiovascular risk. So I try to explain to patients that there's LDL, alpha lousy, that's the so-called bad cholesterol. Then we have HDL, H for happy or high. So you want your HDL to be high, your good cholesterol. Your LDL lousy to be low, alpha low. And then the total cholesterol is a combination of many different things. Uh, a little more sophisticated approach is we also look at what's called non-HDL cholesterol. That's the total cholesterol minus the HDL cholesterol. So the total cholesterol minus your good cholesterol gives you a measure of the other atherogenic or atherosclerosis causing particles that exist in the bloodstream. So it's a little complicated uh, than telling the patient your good cholesterol, your bad cholesterol. We really look at patients in terms of cardiovascular risk, and by lowering LDL cholesterol, we can uh, reduce clinical events, and certainly the cholesterol guidelines and prevention guidelines are cholesterol-centric in reducing clinical events. All right, and now recently we've seen a lot of advancements. Uh, for a while, it just seemed like statins were almost the only option for many of these patients. And now we're seeing add-on statin therapies and other types of therapies that are proven useful for lowering LDL, and even triglycerides. Where do these new agents fit into treatment algorithms? And which of these do you think will prove to be the most impactful as we move forward? Well, therapeutics is very important, but even before we delve into therapeutics, lifestyle modification, which is proper diet and exercise, needs to be the foundation for every single patient we see. So proper diet, and we're talking about low-fat, low-cholesterol diet, we can be talking about a Mediterranean diet, and certainly keeping patients active. So you're talking about at least moderate intensity aerobic activity to 150 minutes per week. I tell my patients uh, the rule of fours, 40 minutes of continuous aerobic activity four days per week. So that's what we try to do. And so once we get everybody moving and eating well, or moving while they're eating, so they'll eat less and burn more, then we can look at therapeutics. Uh, so the minute you have a conversation with a patient, you say, well, uh, your cardiovascular risk is higher, I wanna put you on statin therapy, immediately they look at you and there's a little bit of pushback. So you need to take the time to explain to patients that when it comes to cardiovascular events, it's not like packing a suitcase. The cholesterol doesn't go up and then there's no more room and the plaque explodes. The most common blockage that causes a heart attack is only a 50% obstruction. The plaque becomes unstable, whether it's due to inflammation or many other factors, and then patients can have a clinical event. So statins are the foundation of the medications that we use to treat patients at cardiovascular risk. Now, statins lower the cholesterol numbers, lower the LDL, lower the total cholesterol. They improve HDL, so HDL can go up 5 to 8%, upwards of 10% with some of the different agents. Uh, they lower triglycerides a little bit. Uh, but they also have pleiotropic effects. They are anti-inflammatory. They can stabilize the plaque. So statins are the foundational piece that we use in treating patients at increased cardiovascular risk or with higher cholesterol. Uh, the other fact is there's a group of patients that are statin intolerant, and statin intolerance could be they can't 
take one particular statin, and it's reported anywhere from 7 to 20 percent. So the question is what to do with these people. So as an educational caveat, I tell my colleagues there are different statins within the family of statins. You have hydrophilic statins and lipophilic statins, and the lipophilic statins may be a little more prone uh, to increased muscle symptoms. The uh, hydrophilic statins such as provostatin or rosuvastatin uh, may be less likely to do so. So you always want to consider rechallenging patients. Now saying that, some exciting information, this past April, a uh, new family of cholesterol-lowering medication was launched, bempidoic acid, which is a uh, AC uh, L uh, citrate lyase inhibitor, and it's available to us to lower cholesterol 18% as a standalone, or it's uh, come out in combination with azetamide uh, to lower LDL cholesterol 35 to 40%, very similar reduction to a modern intensity statin. Uh, the other interesting thing with bempidoic acid is it has anti inflammatory effects. So it does also reduce inflammation uh, manifested by elevated CRP. And then as we go down the list, we have other non statins as, as a standalone, such as azetamibe, which we've had Zetia as the brand name, azetamibe's generic since 2002. So bepidoic acid is the first oral lipid-lowering agent that's uh, come along for us since uh, 2002. Uh, so that's available for us. As I said, azetamide is a standalone. Uh, we have the PCSK9 injectables that can be given subcutaneously twice a month or once a month, which are, are more expensive, and certainly patients uh, are not always excited by self-injection. So having uh, non-statin therapy such as bempidoic acid and azetamide available is helpful. And then finally, just to uh, complete the list, other non-statins we have are cholesterol binding uh, agents uh, such as cholestyramine. Uh, but what's also come out as interesting in this area is the use of uh, icosapentyl, uh, which is uh, brand name is Visepa, to reduce cardiovascular events in patients that are on statin therapy with triglycerides that may be 150 uh, milligrams per deciliter. So we have a lot of tools available to us to look at the overall patient's risk and how to treat it. But what we need to do is bring the patient on board. The patient needs to understand the game plan. And if we all can row together, we'll move in the one direction. If we don't take the time to explain the patient to patients the approach, the foundation, diet, exercise, and then the utility of the medications, we're not going to move forward in reducing their cardiovascular risk. So, uh, you know, a little longer answer than you anticipated, but, you know, the therapeutics are important for us, and it's not always all about the statin. And, and studies, recent studies have shown that it, it's the amount of time that one is exposed in their lifetime to atherogenic particles that could put them at risk for early cardiovascular disease. So certainly identifying patients at increased risk due to cholesterol abnormalities is important. There's also a group of patients that are heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia or homozygous uh, hypercholesterolemia that are out there, and then they need more aggressive lipid lowering as well. So that's another group uh, that will benefit from all the therapeutics we have available to us today. I'm glad you touched on the uh, lifestyle factors as a key role. I think uh, one cardiologist once described to me as they tell their patients, just because they take the statin doesn't mean that they can have an extra slice of cake. Um, <laughs> but moving on, you uh, mentioned heterozygous and homozygous uh, familiar, familial hypocholesterolemia. What lipid disorders pose the greatest challenge for you as a cardiologist in today's landscape? Well, we have a bunch of, you know, all comers, so to speak. So, you, you know, when you talk about familial hypercholesterolemia, these are people that may have uh, less LDL receptors or defective LDL receptors or uh, defective mechanism in how LDL is handled. So these are people walking around with a lot of LDL cholesterol and associated with uh, increased risk for early cardiovascular disease. So in this population, 
and you know many clinicians aren't even aware of it, but if the LDL is greater than 190 milligrams per deciliter as they chart, as they chart round and see their patients, that is familial hypercholesterolemia, you know, boom, you found you know, a heterozygous patient, homozygous talking about you know, numbers in the 600s. So it's important for everybody to be vigilant, identify it, and these are the people that need uh, aggressive LDL cholesterol reduction. The recommendation from the guidelines is get the LDL less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. How you do it is important, and it may not be achieved with just high intensity statin therapy. You may need these other agents as add-ons or PCSK9 inhibitors as well, uh, which can lower LDL cholesterol over 60%. So we have many tools to help people. The important thing is we got to get uh, people into the office to be helped. And I do want to say, you know, the, the risk factors for cardiovascular disease are the same risk factors associated with uh, increased risk for COVID-19. When you talk about hypertension, you talk about obesity and diabetes, they're obviously the same uh, risk factors for uh, cardiovascular disease. Yeah, I think you made a good point about you, uh, in order to help patients, you need to get them there to help them. Now, I know the CDC recommends that all adults over the age of 20 should get their cholesterol levels checked every five years. Uh, unfortunately, like a lot of guideline recommendations, most people probably don't get their cholesterol checked every five years as they should. How big of an impact does this have on you as a cardiologist when the first time you're seeing a patient, their cholesterol might be already through the roof and they've already had an event. How much harder does that make management of them going forward? Well, I think the fact that you uh, qualified as them having an event uh, means, you know, that's a full court press. We need to take that patient and say, you're at increased risk for a second event. And then we need to look at you know, other things, lipoprotein A, which is an independent risk factor. It's so, uh, an, a, an A moiety attached to the LDL molecule, which is associated with early uh, heart disease and stroke, early MI and stroke. Uh, so family history is also very important. So I don't, I don't want to negate that. So if you have a patient who comes in and they're perfectly fine, but first degree relative, mom, dad, brother, or sister has had a clinical event, you know, the, the stars should be shooting in the sky and, you know, you should say, hey, you know, I can fix all the other risk factors. I can't change your genetics. But the patient that comes in that's already had a event, we need to, you know, be very aggressive in the lipid lowering, you know, approach. And that is going to be medications and again, diet uh, and everything else because uh, the recommendations are lower LDL, less than 70 milligrams per deciliter or target a uh, target of LDL of less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. And some of the, uh, the European guidelines say a lower LDL less than 55 milligrams per deciliter. And then if they've had a second event, target them for less than 40 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, and we've seen with the PCSK9 studies that we're lowering LDL less than 30 milligrams per deciliter. And 11% of these patients are going on and having clinical events, despite aggressive LDL cholesterol reduction. So there's something we also refer to as residual risk, risk beyond LDL cholesterol, and that could be due to inflammation. And one of the benefits that uh, we've seen with uh, VASEPA, uh, generic of icosapent to ethyl, is that maybe the magic there is in its anti-inflammatory effect uh, as well, because you had a 25% reduction in clinical events and uh, we wouldn't necessarily attribute that to change in triglycerides. So looking at an individual patient, there's, you know, there's risk from cholesterol, there's risk from uh, uh, inflammation, there's you know, risk from thrombotic risk. So you know, when a patient comes in, we have to look at all these different avenues and how to correct the problem. Uh, now just reversing a little bit, I think it's important, and I'm a clinician and I have you know, very busy practice in addition to the Lipid Center, we are all, as clinicians, we are very good at saying, I want you to go on a diet, uh, and maybe we give you a tear sheet, but we really need to be more proactive. And what we found here at the Lipid Center, we have a registered dietitian as part of our team. We have someone that can spend an hour plus with the patients, make some corrections in what they're doing, uh, 
and a Mediterranean diet also has anti-inflammatory uh, effects as well, in addition to lowering cholesterol. But having someone who's an expert in that area is better and more effective than what the clinician can do in a 15 or 20 minute visit or a one hour consultation. And the uh, registered dietitian can follow up with these patients. So it does take a village and it does take a team. Saying that, in addition to the team, we have impressive therapeutics. And as I said earlier, one of the uh, things I'm excited about with benpidoic acid may be its anti-inflammatory effect. Statins have an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, specific icosapin uh, ethyl has an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, as I said, benpidoic acid has an anti-inflammatory effect. And we've seen you know, from an earlier trial called the Cantos trial that by not manipulating LDL cholesterol and just manipulating inflammation with a monoclonal antibody, we had a 15% further reduction in clinical events just by affecting the inflammatory pathway. So uh, I just want everyone to know that it's a multifactorial process. But the original question, which is, is the purpose of the piece, is it is Cholesterol Education Month, and I think we need to educate the patients uh, on what they need to do, encourage them that we're all part of a, of a team and that we're going to work with them to move forward on this and really reduce their overall cardiovascular risk. Remembering that in the Framingham trial, one third of patients had a normal cholesterol and went on and had a heart attack. So uh, I think the message is important. Know your numbers, but know your risk. Know your cardiovascular risk. And the docs need to take the time to really elucidate that for the patient so they can walk out of there saying, hey, I can do this. I have help doing this. And not only that, I'm going to be on the right medical therapeutics to lower my risk so I don't have uh, an MI like my dad did or my uncle did or so on and so forth. So that's important for us, Patrick, too. It's not just know your numbers. It's know your cardiovascular risk and then finding the right team to help you move forward to reduce your risk. All right. Thank you for that. And just lastly, you touched on it a bit in that last answer, some differences between the U.S. and European guidelines and how important it is to sort of keep your patients as informed as possible in their own cholesterol management. When we use the term in medicine, aggressive treatment or aggressive lipid lowering therapy, a lot of times patients might be a bit adverse to that term aggressive. It implies some things in their mind. Is there any danger to aggress more aggressively treating LDL or lipid lowering and trying to get to, say, the European recommended numbers as opposed to the American recommended numbers for patients? I think that's a great question. So just uh, like I tell my children, I would tell the clinicians, use your words carefully. You know, words have meaning. So aggressive, uh, I think aggressive should be replaced with effective. So we're gonna use effective cholesterol lowering. I also think that patients need to know numbers. I know in the last uh, cholesterol guidelines, we, we moved to intensity of statin therapy, moderate intensity statin therapy, high intensity statin therapy. Uh, but the data, and the data is for the clinician, show that even lowering LDL cholesterol in the PCSK9 trials to a median of uh, 30 milligrams per deciliter reduced, you know, a, Further, we had a further reduction in clinical events. And even at 30 milligrams per deciliter, patients still went on in clinical events as well, which gets into a discussion of residual risk. So I think it's important for us as clinicians to be aware that, you know, the number 70 in the high risk and very high risk population is a target number. It doesn't mean, ah, I hit 69, I'm done. You know, the patient still has risk or oh my God, my, the cholesterol went down to 25, you know, I'm stopping. You know, what we found out with the PCSK9 trials, that lowering LDL cholesterol very low had no ill effects, no cognitive effects, uh, no metabolic effects uh, in terms of, uh, you know, patient safety. So a lot of clinicians, you know, get back a number and it's like, oh my God, this LDL is too low, I got to stop. And the reality is I just said, you don't need to stop. We have targets. We have targets for a reason. So I think, uh, again, it has to be a team approach. So when the patient comes in, 
you know, you're going to say, Mr. Smith, we have a very effective plan for you. We're going to lower your cholesterol effectively and reduce your cardiovascular risk. I need you to work together. Now, you know, sometimes I kid around, I call that, you know, nuts and bolts, meaning nuts from a Mediterranean diet and bolts for what I have to do as a clinician to clunk along. But the reality is, uh, lifestyle modification is the foundation and then each individual's risk is assessed. Uh, physicians should not be afraid to lower LDL cholesterol. It's still our surrogate marker as a target for reducing clinical events. And then once we're happy with our target, then we can look at what else can we do for this particular patient to lower the risk. And that may come from the addition of adding specific uh, fish oil or adding benfidoic acid or following you know, high sensitivity to reactive protein or you know, down the road, other, other biomarkets we'll be looking at, but it's a lifetime of risk and that's, that's important for us. So I would stay away from the word aggressive. Uh, I don't think the Europeans are more aggressive uh, than we are. I think they just uh, jumped on the results from the PCSK9 trials with uh, uh, Evolocumab and Aliurocumab in the Odyssey trial, the Fourier trial, and said, this is where we have to go. But I will say one thing. The diabetic population, they suffer from diabetes, but they die from heart attack and stroke. So the diabetics are increased risk for cardiovascular events, initial events and subsequent events. So the Diabetic Society guidelines recommend LDL less than 70 for high risk, and they recommend LDL of less than 55 for very high risk diabetics with uh, had cardiovascular events. So a target of 55 in the diabetic population is already out there. And maybe the endocrinologists aren't pushing to that target level because they're so focused on controlling the uh, diabetic state. Uh, but we as clinicians, whether it's cardiologists, internists, uh, we need to push the uh, LDL cholesterol much lower in our diabetic population and then look at other factors we can help with diabetics, whether it's triglycerides, non-HDL cholesterol, and, and that group particularly may benefit from specific uh, fish oil therapy in addition to high intensity statin therapy. So while the Europeans may have 55, the endocrinologists are way ahead of the Europeans. They had 55 before, before they did. So uh, hats off to the endocrinologists in the United States. But that aside, uh, never be aggressive with your patients. Be inclusive with your patients and you know, have it as a team approach moving forward. And if they understand that, they'll follow up, they'll get their blood work, on a regular basis, they'll understand potential side effects and be comfortable reaching out to you. And certainly having the ability to offer them nutritional counseling is another uh, important thing that we can offer patients. Uh, so that's, as I said, a multifactorial process to help patients uh, lower their risk. All right, thank you for that. And that was about it on my questions. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us about National Cholesterol Education Month. One other thing, Patrick, if I may. Yeah, sure. Well, while September is National Cholesterol Education Month, plaque doesn't stop for September, right? So plaque marches on 12 months a year, 365 days a year. So it's great that we're waving the flags uh, every September. This year we do it remotely, but you know, we need to be vigilant uh, every single day. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in men and women. Uh, we have an obesity epidemic in young adults, adolescents uh, coming into young adulthood and adulthood. Uh, and it's important for us as a society to take a step back and, and again, as I said earlier, reduce cardiovascular risk. So while I salute September being cholesterol month, every day is cardiovascular risk day. Every month is cardiovascular risk month, and every year is, hey, another victory for patient care. So thank you, Patrick, for giving me the time.